I spent a huge part of my life feeling like I had to hide who I was. Part of the reason that we go rock climbing is to push ourselves in an environment that doesn't feel as high stakes. Okay, I'm on. Oh, keep me really close. Will this stay? It probably won't stay. Okay, um... Uh, uh, you can just try really lightly take. <laughs> really light, um... Okay. Really light. It's not gonna stay. Oh, that bolt's so far away. Oh, fucking A. Um... Uh, oh, I wish that this wasn't what I was doing right now. Part of what brings me to climbing is that I want to try something that doesn't necessarily feel possible. You don't choose a challenge that's hard enough that it's going to make you be vulnerable and make you be in stress then it, you'll just stay the same human, and that's fine. But if you choose something that's hard enough that you have to change in order to get it, you can make a lot of progress. And that's what I'm seeking out in climbing in general. It's almost like practice being in a vulnerable space. Come on, Lord. Nice. I was working in the southeast this fall, and now that the clinics have wrapped up, I get to spend a month in the Red River Gorge. The Red is a special place for me. I grew up climbing in the Detroit area, and the Red was one of our closest crags. Like the first time I ever climbed down here, my mom and I came down. I had a rope that I had won at a competition and like two quick draws. And I thought maybe I was gonna like be able to set up top ropes or something. Um, but that was not the case because it's the Red River Gorge and it's not really like a top rope accessible area. And I just like bouldered the start of all the climbs because I just like really wanted to go rock climbing. I always felt like the opportunities to go outside and climb were working toward what you ultimately wanted to do. And I always thought, oh, how sad to be stuck in the gym all the time. So if we could go somewhere, if it's only six hours, we should go, you know. You would just load up however many of us you could fit for the weekend. Like we'd all just like jump into the car. But you'd always climb with us too. Yeah, I would try to climb. At that point, I could kind of keep up in the beginning. <laughs> I just didn't get to play much as a kid. I wanted you to have experiences I didn't have, but I had so much fun doing them because I kind of missed that aspect of growing up. I was a pretty goofy kid in some ways, and I think in some ways I kind of like taught you how to play and that, but you also like gave me that space to do that.
I was just so happy that they had a passion, just that you would feel like there was something in life that you want to work toward and something that gave your life meaning. I was excited to see how psyched you were. You really developed from there and it influenced every part of your life. When I was down here, I like went through the grades of 511. I like did my first 512 on gear. And that's a huge part of my history here is going through that. But when I think back to that time, like I actually have this portrait that my friend took of me at the time. I can look into my eyes like a younger version of me and be like, wow. I was going through probably the hardest times mentally and emotionally. It can be hard to like revisit that here. I mean, I think back to like just being pretty confused about what I was experiencing. When I first tried to explain my identity, I was talking to my sister and we just like tried. We were like, well, I think that means you're a lesbian. Like, I'm pretty sure that, that kind of lines up. And it's like, we were looking for the only words that we had. It's really hard to articulate what's going on if you don't have words for it. It took a long time for me to even know that there were people that were non-binary, to know that I wasn't the only person in the world that had my gender identity. It made a lot more sense to me when Laura finally came out to me as non-binary or like on the trans spectrum than when they came out to me as a lesbian when they were younger. Calling Laura my sister never felt super fitting. Like it always felt like something that caught in my throat. Like, is this the right way to describe this person who is part of my family and so important to me? You were like the original person that I like came out to or talked about these things to. That's like a really beautiful thing to know like this person I really care about has just articulated to me that like they'll be here with me right now and they're like open to whatever changes. I think that the way that all of us express ourselves can be um, different day to day but also I think like just as you get older and as you have more autonomy you're able to explore that more. Okay, off we go. It's really uncomfortable to ask someone to change the pronouns that they use for you because it's an obvious outing of yourself. I put so much work into like feeling out this part of me and like trying to like get a hold of enough of an identity of who I am to be able to take care of myself and be able to put words to my existence in a way that everyone else gets to. And then you get misgendered over and over, people kind of disregard your pronouns. And then you're like, okay, well, maybe I'll just give up on that. But then the more you give up on that, the more you give up on taking care of yourself and feeling like you belong and feeling like you're connected to the world. And that's really a dangerous space to get into, especially when you're like a person that didn't think you were really worth it. In the past few years, I've spent a lot of time on the road teaching and traveling to climb. This year, it's been really nice to settle in more to Flagstaff. So today, we're going to focus specifically on the falling task. Falling and climbing are both dangerous, right? So learning it as a skill minimizes the risk. 
And then also what you just said, when you're climbing, then you're not as distracted by the fear of falling because you know what's gonna happen. I first got to know about the Warrior's Way when I was a pretty young climber. I was very scared and took like kind of a funky fall early on in my lead climbing um, that made me just not want to do it anymore. At the time, I would just leave the gym really often feeling very disempowered and feeling like I was maybe just like a scared person when everyone else had things figured out. Yeah, that was really nice. Okay, so you can start there. Just that one breath, pop for the move, fall on the exhale. I had a friend who was aware of the Warrior's Way material and he knew there was a clinic coming up. And so he convinced me to sign up and it ended up being really helpful. Really nice. Over time, it changed my perspective on stress and fear. And it gave me a lot of resources that I could use in climbing and also in other aspects of my life. I haven't had a project that felt really inspiring in a while. There's a route called the Cousin of Death that two of my friends put up. It's on one of the most beautiful panels of rock that I've ever seen. I imagine that this project is going to take a couple of seasons to do. The 600 foot route broken into five pitches. Two of those pitches are some of the hardest rock climbing I've ever done on gear. The grade and the style of the other two pitches is also going to be challenging for me. So putting all of the climbing together in a day is going to be the biggest and hardest climbing objective that I've taken on. The approach that I'm taking on this route, because it's such a big objective, and because it's at the limit of my ability, is to work each pitch individually and then put them together as a whole. I decided to work on the fourth pitch first. Working the pitches for me means using a device that I can climb with alone to top rope so that I can work moves, learn sequences, figure out where I'm gonna place the gear. Oh shit. If I'm close. Oh shit. Yeah, I like it. Wow. The fourth pitch has a lot of hard climbing, but it all comes down to this one mono pocket move where you have to just turn it in and make a precise but kind of dynamic move to the next hold. Oh God, it's the second time today I've just been so gassed there. After that crux move, there's this really thin traverse that even if you stuck everything up to there, you could totally blow it on. I feel like my green bars, they could be an interesting discussion topic. It's like something that I'm 100% sure that I will eat on my climbing day. And I know that it like has like a mix of the things that I need in my body. And they're also fucking weird. I'm like, I wish that I could come out and just eat a peanut butter sandwich, you know? <laughs> like, 
Like that would be like a very easy thing to do. Would be to like bring a cliff bar out. Or even one of those like fancy good tasting bars. If I tried it and like if it was a good day, like a good like mental day, I would eat it. But if it was a day when like I wasn't doing as well, then I just wouldn't eat. So I was like, okay, I need to figure out a way that I will like 100% eat no matter what. And it turned out that putting a little kale in my bar made me eat. But I hate when people are like, it's healthy because I'm like, no, it's like literally like this is like a microcosm of like how it feels to like deal with food on a daily basis. So it's like funny when people ask about it. Like, I'm not about to tell you about my, like, sweet keto diet. Like, I'm about to tell you about, like, my eating disorder, if you really want to, like, have the answer to that question. And most people don't want to know about your eating disorder. <laughs> they want to know about your sweet keto diet. They want to know about your sweet keto diet, which is, like, basically the same thing. I started struggling with an exercise and eating disorder when I was seven or eight years old. That was the age when I started getting messages about what it meant to be a certain gender and the expectations that were put on me because of that. When I hit puberty, it got a lot worse because my body started changing, which was really scary. My eating disorder was a way that I managed body dysphoria. Maybe the best way to describe that is being trapped in a body that doesn't align with your gender identity. But it's not just about your internal experience, it's also about how you're being perceived and your ability to express your gender. And so when I learned that I could control that with food and exercise, I was on top of that right away. And I was like, oh, okay, sweet, that's how I'll live my life. Not realizing how destructive that could be. When I first moved to Arizona, I was still struggling with a lot of eating disorder behaviors. I had a few friends who intervened and just said, hey, this is something you can keep working on. There were a lot of layers of recovery. Being light for climbing is something that people really prioritize. I was able to find a lot of empowerment in being strong rather than light. Another layer of eating, though, was that I used my eating behaviors as a form of self-harm. Those kinds of behaviors are protective, so when I stopped using them, I had to deal with some really tough emotions that came up and had to learn better coping skills. <laughs> the last layer of that was that gaining weight for me during recovery was something that made me feel more feminine at the time. It increased my body dysphoria, which was something that I had used my eating disorder to manage all along. I had always considered myself someone that didn't need help transitioning. When I realized how destructive the ways that I had it covered were to my body, I realized that medically transitioning was going to be a really important thing for me. It's really personal how someone affirms their gender. It is not okay to ask a trans person about their experience with transition. It's their personal medical information and they're doing their best to live their life in a body that feels right to them.
Nico came out with me today, and we're gonna go lead the thing. Well, the fourth pitch. We're gonna try to lead the fourth pitch. But we're not gonna try. We're actually, like, we're going to actually lead it. Trying doesn't really imply, like, the actual thing that we're gonna do. I'm not, like, nervous about sending or not, or even something, like, going wrong. It's more just, like, what's it gonna feel like? I think I spent, like, an extra half an hour of not sleeping last night thinking about where I was gonna clip the bolt below the roof. Okay. You can take. Man, I like, didn't know what I was even doing and then I like grabbed it and then, oh, how can I? Oh, felt good anyway. Thanks. I don't know why I grabbed the draw. I mean, I know why I grabbed the draw. It was like I had already gone to clip it and then I felt like I was gonna fall while I was like in the position of clipping. And then when your my brain thought that, then it grabbed the draw. Okay, Nico, I'm off the way. Nice work. Thanks. I got a one hang. I wasn't expecting that today. Like I didn't have my head wrapped around that being what was gonna happen. I was like expecting some aid climbing missions on that last go. I think knowing that there's another non-binary climber is huge. <laughs> Not only like, like in the abstract, like, oh yeah, there's like another non-binary climber. Cause it's like, yeah, like there's going to be non-binary climbers cause there's non-binary people everywhere. Um, but to like have that be someone who's in my community, that was really cool. And to like feel a little less alone in that. I think it's really important to have that visible representation on a larger level. The world around you has been shaped by erasing trans people from history and from culture. And so then you have this idea that like, oh, trans people didn't exist until recently. Like they're this new thing. And that's simply not the case. I would definitely view Laura as a mentor. They're just like very good at looking inward and understanding themselves and then like figuring out how that allows them to give in the best way to the community and to the people around them and also what they're trying to do with their climbing.
Okay, Nico, you can take. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <sighs> okay. That was awesome. Thank you. Is that my project? <laughs> Have you done the long, far out one of these? Where you put your legs really far out and then you try to keep the knees down and then you lean over? I've been trying that recently. I can't get my knees down. Oh, like this. Ooh! It really gets different things. Ooh. And then I think a really important thing to do for camera on the camera is you give me a massage. <laughs> In front of other people, you often have to like explain yourself, even if you feel pretty comfortable with someone, you're kind of performing a little bit. With Amanda, it's like I'm with this extension of myself. Relationships aren't like polished, and you don't get to always bring the best version of yourself to them. And so it's really important to trust the other person to take you in any form. I was not out as trans to Amanda when we started dating. And it's something that she's grown into with me. Whoa. I got one. Can I go higher? Okay. I got several. A conversation I think we've had recently, but also a lot, is like self-care. And I think it's been really cool to see Lore come out as trans and feel really comfortable in their body, which I think they'd, they'd never really felt. Self-care can be really hard. The scariness that comes with telling people, that was not even a choice. It was the option of moving forward with their life in a way that felt like it was genuine. I'm attracted to Laura no matter what, and I think that was helpful for Laura to be like, oh, I'm not just attracted to you when you're this one person, and I'm attracted to you as a human. It's really helpful to know that I have a person in my corner that I can come back to and feel safe with. I don't have to be something that I'm not. Amanda took off today for her next Knowles course. She's gonna be in the field for probably a month or two. Like when she's gone, I'd notice, you know, but I'm also like, oh, okay, she's gone doing her thing. But then when she's back, it's like really fun. I feel like I'm able to just have someone to like share all the things with and that makes like all the things feel more fun. The fourth pitch came together a lot quicker than I thought. It definitely expanded my idea of what might be possible. There's still a lot of season left. I can go down and work the first pitch now, which from the beginning has been some of the most inspiring movement to me. When I'm really thinking about getting a project, and I'm looking for something to work on that's challenging. When you're working at that limit of your physical ability and also maybe mental ability, you're having to learn. Okay. Part of the reason that we go rock climbing is definitely to have fun and to play. And part of that is to push ourselves in an environment that doesn't feel as high stakes. Mm-hmm. <sighs>
obviously rock climbing, a lot of people think of it as a dangerous sport or really adventure seeking. But actually, if you're managing the risk, it's a lot safer than your everyday life because in everyday life, the mistakes you make can have really big influences on like the rest of your life. But if you fail on your climbing move, you just do it again. Oh God. This is so hard, you can't hit the wrong place with your foot. Wait, I had a piece of chocolate for the first time since I was eight years old last night. It is awesome. Chocolate's an awesome thing. I've had like chocolate flavored things, but I haven't just had like a chocolate bar for in, since I was eight. It tastes really good. <laughs> I was pretty excited about it. I have a lot of foods that are safe foods and I have foods that are not safe foods. I decided I was going to try and eat some of my unsafe foods. So chocolate bar was one of them. It's pretty silly to be afraid of food. I like teach people about fear all the time but then I'm afraid of like this food. That's like a funny thing. It's not like a very real threat to your existence. But the way that I've learned to like keep myself mentally and emotionally safe is having this sense of stability through food. If you're like a little kid and your world feels very uncontrolled and you find a way to like find a sense of security and a sense of stability, that's pretty wise as far as survival goes. So I try not to critique myself that much for it. But that doesn't mean that I want to carry all of those habits for the rest of my life. It's okay if it gives you a five minute breather on your hike or a two second breather. For the years I've been climbing with Laura, it's been a real pleasure to watch them grow up as a climber and a human being. From all these routes that we're, we're trying and we're climbing on, we're, we're constantly learning. I think being scared is part of it, but everything disappears when you leave the ground. All your issues, all your family shit, all your work stuff, it just goes away. And you're there doing what you need to do that day. To remember not to take myself too seriously this time. It's not like you're like putting a bunch of pressure, you just like kind of like feel like, okay, you're, we're, we're doing a thing. <laughs> okay. All right, give her hell. Hell yeah. When Laura asked me to check out this route, I just immediately said yes. I knew it was going to be hard. And if I could help them in any way to reach their goal, I'm going to be there for them. The first pitch is a dihedral that starts out with hardly any hold on the first half. <laughs> You're doing a lot of palming and pressing. There's a few desperate layback moves. Everything is insecure. They know that that's my style and that's the kind of route I also want to do. Oh, that last foot move. Oh. 
it's like it's definitely not over when you get that foot move but that's the last move of the crux it's like getting the foot in here oh oh god bummer i was shaking a lot on that pitch like i just had a lot of adrenaline there are very few moves that you couldn't slip off of. It's just a hard pitch. I look at Lauren now and they become the climber I've always wanted to be. They're one of the most driven individuals that I've ever met inside and outside of climbing. I'm psyched for where it's going to take them. Yay! Ah. <laughs> nice work. <sighs> Damn. Every time I get out with Lauren, it just gets my stoke up a little bit more. And it makes me want to get out and try harder again. I don't really necessarily care if I can do all the moves or send the route, but as long as I'm trying hard and they're trying hard and we're helping each other, that's what partnership is. That's what makes it great. That was awesome. Yeah, it was watching that. <sighs> so are you going to leave this next one? My God, no. <laughs> Recently, there's been more visibility in the trans community, but being the person that's creating that visibility or that representation can also be really painful. The truth is, is that every day I experience violence of some kind that makes me feel like it's not safe to be in my body and not safe to be visible. There was an article that came out recently about a rock climb that I did, and it featured me as the first non-binary climber to climb 514 on gear. But the backlash that I got from my community and the online space was very painful for me to take in. You know, these aren't just internet trolls. 
these are people that are other climbers that I might see when I'm out just doing my thing. And they just said these violent things about me and a part of me that I can't control. Some of the hate speech that was shared on that post was left up because people said that it wasn't okay to censor them or that it was just like a political discussion. But they don't realize that for trans people, it's someone debating whether we're allowed to be a human or not. And that language directly translates into experiences of real violence in our lives. It's scary when you see that kind of language from people in your community because you start to second guess yourself when you go out. You start to wonder who you have to hide your identity from. I spent a huge part of my life feeling like in order to be a part of the community, I had to hide who I was because I wouldn't be safe. I've put a lot of work into feeling like a person that can be authentic, that can show up and create that representation for other people. And then when I get those violent messages, it makes me just want to hide again. It also makes me sad because I know that other trans people are reading those comments too. When people are hateful towards me for being non-binary, other non-binary people are seeing that and absorbing that hate and imagining that if they were living openly and talking about their identity, that that's the same hate they would receive. It makes the outdoors start to feel really unsafe. Working on the second pitch now, you know, I just really didn't know what to expect. It definitely gets a lower grade than the other two, but there's a difference in the commitment factor on it. I tried to mini track on it, to rehearse it, and it just ended up being like kind of a half doing the moves, half trying to aid climb and get the directionals out endeavor. lead burns are kind of the only way to practice it or to climb on it. That means that every time I want to go out there, I need to get a partner who's willing. And climbing on it, there's a lot of shenanigans, like to clean the roof. It's not easy to do. My partners aren't always psyched to second it a bajillion times. And it's scary. Oh, Nico, you can take. I'm scared. The rock is really slick. There are spots where you could place a big cam perfectly and it would just rip out of the crack. So you have to place the gear in really specific spots where it will hold and then just keep climbing between those placements. Okay, keep me close. Uh, uh. Oh God, take. I don't want to. <laughs> I just didn't want to make that transition. Goodness. More than the individual moves, putting this pitch together feels really hard. Mentally and physically and then logistically. Oh, this stay. Oh God, this hurt. It probably won't stay. Okay. Um. Uh. uh you can just try really lightly taking. <laughs> really light. Um. Okay. Really light. Retaking. It's not gonna stay. Oh, that bolt's so far away. Oh, fucking hey. Um. Uh. Oh, I wish that this wasn't what I was doing right now. Um. Oh, Nika, I'm scared. Um, can you take? Yeah. 
I don't know what to do. I'm gonna get back to that bolt. Oh, it's coming out. Oh my fucking head. Okay. It's funny how a pitch can get in your head. I feel like from the beginning of working this, I thought of this as like the scary pitch. So now I'm like scared on it. <laughs> but it's like, it's just a pitch of rock climbing. That felt good. That made it feel like possible. Today might have been my last day on the climb. Matt and I are gonna try and come out on Tuesday, but there's snow on the forecast and I'm not sure if we'll be able to beat it. You should take more rest days than I have been, but it's like, yeah. yeah, but it's like the end of like, it's like, I don't know, it's closing out. Looks kind of messed up right now. At least we have a static line that stays fixed. Makes it feel less ominous. Is it raining? Yeah. The world is like, hey, Lord, you tried to take no rest days, but here's, here's one that's mandatory. We really care about you and your fingers and your elbows. As we were walking down here, I was thinking about how it would be nice to be able to get a definitive answer about the weather before we wrapped in. And I think we're getting a definitive answer about the weather right now. a week, I work on like a crisis hotline. People do definitely chat in when they're having suicidal thoughts, but it's also just all kinds of crises, right? Like a crisis doesn't have to be a suicide crisis. It can also just be something that feels really intense for the person that's chatting in. Well, it's the election night, right? I think there's a lot of people that are really hurting right now. It's like actually it feels good to like be doing a shift because I feel like people are waiting for an excuse to kind of give up. There like there were a lot of people that were like really depending on this election as like a last resort. Like you can't actually prevent it, but it kind of feels like you're like addressing that rather than just like hoping and like crossing your fingers. Try not to check Pennsylvania again. I'm gonna check on Pennsylvania in a second. I'm gonna try not to. It's like there is something comforting from checking. I'm gonna check Pennsylvania. Don't worry, no more of the vote has been turned in. There was definitely a time in my life where, like, 
whenever something went wrong, I like took it as proof that I like shouldn't have decided to like stay around. Like I was like, see, like things really don't get better. Like this really fucking sucks. Like I don't want to keep going. And I would like use it as these kind of like, I would just like imagine escaping when things got tough. It's like in some ways it's proof that I should be here. Cause it's like the world needs people that are willing to like stay when things are hard. I hit a really low point when I was 17. I had started to explore my identity a lot more. I had come out to some important people and I had experienced my first rejections from people that I really cared about. It made everywhere I went start to feel really unsafe. That summer, I was raped by a boy that went to my school. And after the experience, he started sending me messages, threatening me, saying that he was going to out me. He held it over my head as if he was like justified in having hurt me and justified in hurting me again. I didn't feel like I could tell anyone I guess I just felt like the whole world was against me in a way. I felt like if people really knew who I was, that they would think it was my fault. At the time, I leaned into just having this identity of being an athlete. Oh, I'm a runner. I'm a climber. I have these parts of me that I can tell you about, so then I don't have to tell you about these parts that feel unsafe. That year I ended up having a really bad hip injury and had to have hip surgery and it took away all of my healthy coping mechanisms. I still had access to the pain meds from my surgery and I overdosed. My mom came home from work. I remember telling her and I remember thinking she was going to be mad and I just remember her like giving me the biggest hug and like just telling me that it was like that it was going to be okay that I was going to be okay. I really thought I was going to die and I thought that it was like I like finally felt safe like I was getting this like amazing hug from my mom and I was like oh actually like she knows who I am and she still loves me. I didn't know what to do, but I just figured maybe if I loved you enough and was there behind you and for you, I could maybe help you. I just really wanted you to be around. <laughs> I loved you so much. I didn't want you to, to leave, you know? I didn't want you to go. I just wanted you to know that even when you do feel broken that, and you did feel broken that you, it wasn't like you, you couldn't put the pieces back together and that you couldn't be even stronger than before. You never know. I mean, there's other people who aren't as lucky as I was and, you know, you really fought your way through it. There's like stages of recovery for me. Eventually you get to this point where you're like, okay, I've essentially like opted in. We have like opted in to being here. I have to find a way to make that sustainable. Not just be healthy enough to like keep going when I'm 25, but like still be healthy enough to keep going when I'm like 35 and 45. And it's been really scary because I think like, I hadn't really made myself opt in. <laughs> like, you know, since I was like 17, I just, there wasn't like a point where I was like, okay, you're like permanently opted in. It was more of a just like, I'm going to take life day by day. There's going to be a lot of like really beautiful things and really like awesome progress that happens. 
but it's also like the most painful thing that you could go through. Like allowing yourself to like be this thing that there's not really like a script for. I really thought that the snow was going to end the season this year, but it ended up warming up a bit and drying out. I convinced my friend Evan to come out with me today and just give it one more go. I'm trying to calm down. I just want to have fun out here, you know, but at the same time, it's like I come out here, I invest a lot of time because I have a goal, right? And like, I want to achieve it. And so when I have a little bit of time left, there's like more pressure to achieve the goal more quickly, which can make you actually like sloppy or distracted. You can just take tight. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. No. I. I don't know what happened. Oh, my, my personal favorite question that we ask athletes, though, is: Were you desiring to have something for nothing? <laughs> When you're like frustrated that you didn't send, it's usually because you're like annoyed that you're having to put in the amount of work that you are. It's funny, I don't really want to like boink a bunch, but part of me wants to like take a slightly longer fall to just like get used to the fall more and more. Like, cause this is like my opportunity to also project that fall. Okay, you can give me a little slack. somewhere and you have experience with it and doing it relaxed then it's like you're going to be able to pay attention and if you haven't taken that kind of fall before and it's like outside of your comfort zone then it's going to be harder to pay attention it's like kind of a no fall zone like so much of like I think the like conversations that I have with people is like our fear isn't like stupid or something to hate it's like wise and it's like letting us know things about ourselves and that's not like ooey gooey, like esoteric thing. It's like, no, it's like, we're gonna feel anxiety or feel scared when like our needs aren't met, you know? So like, what do you actively have to do to like get your needs met? And I think instead of like, that's the thing is like that voice of like shame or blame, it's like, it's just not, there's nothing productive about it. Like, if I want to go take that fall, then I should do falling practice, and I could, should figure out, like, what's comfortable for me, and then I should start practicing there. And if I'm not willing to do that, or I don't feel like I have time for it, then I shouldn't be surprised if I'm scared, but I also shouldn't blame myself. It's like, I just haven't done it, right? And so, like, my brain's going to have a message about whether it's safe or not. And that's what I teach, but I think the reason I'm able to teach it is just because I've been there.
That's fine. <laughs> Pitch 2 ended up being so interesting because I was in this mode of like just kind of getting spooked at this one spot and realized that I wasn't really rehearsing. Once I'd realized that and decided to like go back and really rehearse those final moves, and it felt almost easy. Sometimes you get so distracted by the logistics, by being nervous, by all the things going on that I almost like forgot to just climb well. When I actually started rock climbing well, then it worked and I sent and then sent the last pitch. It feels really humbling to have put so much time into this this season. It feels really exciting to have somewhere farther to go. I'm really excited to come back and climb the route in a push, leading all the pitches from the bottom to the top. change this sock on the other side? Uh, sure. Amanda figured out that she could stabilize her bed frame with socks and underwear. <laughs> yeah. Is that right? I'm always excited when Laura sends their projects because they're excited. But I think something I've noticed, like especially in the past year, is just a really good balance of rock climbing and other loves and rest as well. You can tell someone is like taking care of like all aspects of their life. Success is awesome and it feels good. You get like a rush of nice happy hormones when it happens. But there's not joy and longevity in success, right? Because success is literally like, boom, done. Things that happen every day or that are ongoing, that's where you get to find enjoyment. This thing looks interesting. Okay. I'm gonna try it. Okay. Sending is a success, but self-care is a process. In the end, the long-term change and day-to-day -day investment matters so much more. I did it. Beautiful. We were out here much longer than I said. It's like, let's do one more. Can we do three more? <laughs> when you're growing up and you just want to be a normal kid, and you're told that things that you can't change about yourself make you not normal. It involves taking a look every day and finding a way to show up and live well in a world that is not designed for you to show up and live well in. You can't wait for other people to tell you you're allowed to exist. You have to like first decide that you're allowed to exist and take care of yourself as such. It's really empowering, I think, just to make that decision. I'm gonna be a person that's taken care of. But that actually means that like, I have to take care of myself. I'm like in the full frontal, like, trust lean right now. Just like, please, real, don't drop me on the ground. <laughs> Driving face first.
Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to the premiere of They Them. We're going to be having a panel with Blake, Justin, and my friend Nikki Smith, who's going to be moderating. We'll talk a little bit about the background of the film and some of the things that you can take with you from the film and bring back to your own communities to continue the conversation that we started this evening. Hello everyone, my name is Nikki Smith and I'm going to be moderating the panel tonight with Laura, Blake and Justin and we're going to dive right into some of the questions. So for all of you, how did you get to know one another and start this film project? Yeah, so Laura and I have been friends basically I think since you moved to town. Um, so that was kind of the impetus for the film in some part, just knowing each other. Um, yeah, Blake and I were climbing partners and I had, when I was first in town, he was one of the first people to reach out to me and make me feel really welcome in the community. And so we had had just a ton of conversations about, you know, all of the things in our lives, but including my journey and my exploration of my gender identity. And so he was aware of that and knew that it was an important part of what I was experiencing at the time. Yeah, and Blake and I have been making films together for a few years now. And um, Blake came to me one day um, and told me about lore. And just we started kind of talking through a few ideas about, you know, what that kind of story could look like. Um, not really talking about making a film yet, but Blake was just interested in kind of exploring the idea. And, and it just kind of snowballed from there. And that was almost three years ago now. Yeah, it's been a long time and we've all gotten, we were close before the project, but I think that since the project has started, we've all gotten really close as friends and um, each other's support network. Definitely. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. I'm guessing at the start of this, for Justin and Blake, you probably didn't realize maybe even the complexity of the story, it seemed like it evolved quite a bit as time went on. Can you talk a little bit about that process and how you went about telling the story? Yeah, so I guess when Laura and I first started talking about telling the story, um, I realized for me, I needed to do a bunch of my own research so that I was more informed on like the topics. So I went and did that. And then, you know, throughout the whole process, we've it's been like a really collaborative process, um, navigating how we decided we were going to tell your story. Um, and yeah, I'm sure you have some thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, it was really important from the beginning. I mean, our, our pitch deck, so one of the things that you, you know, do when you are trying to get a film funded is you put together a pitch deck. And our, our pitch deck was very um, clear in that Blake and I were going to utilize our skills as filmmakers to help Lore tell their story. Um, and we just kind of opened ourselves up to what that process might look like. And so it was a lot of, of conversations that uh, uh, kind of led down a path that we ended up never pursuing. Um, and kind of coming back and seeing this film kind of unravel as more of a, a verite telling of, of Laura's story. And, and um, yeah, it was very interesting. We had started out with one climb in mind and then that climb you know, ended up going to the back seat and this other climb came about and, and it ended up working as kind of a perfect, I don't know, metaphor in a certain way uh, to be able to have these conversations that we had in the film. And, and uh, yeah, from beginning to end, it was very collaborative, like Blake said, and, and um, I think just kind of honoring the process of, of learning and growing through the, through the entire uh, filmmaking process. I think something that stood out to me for both Blake and Justin was the way that, like Blake mentioned, they really did their own education, right? Like they didn't come to me with their kind of 101 questions about my gender identity or my experience. They went out of their way to really look into those things so they had that knowledge so that when we had conversations, it was really about me as an individual and allowing me to express my own experience. And it wasn't as much about getting them up to speed about kind of the basics of how I wanted to exist in the world. And it was really important to me as a friend that I saw them putting in that effort 
And it was a way that they showed me that they love me, right? Of really being able to support me in an effective way. And also not assuming that they knew everything because they had already gone out and done a little bit of research. They still gave me a lot of space to express myself and tell them what felt comfortable and uncomfortable um, and allow my story to be complex because I'm a human, right? And everyone's story is pretty complex. Well, it sounds like all of you went through a long process of learning and, and exploring in this. Can each of you tell me a little bit about what you felt you learned the most or what was most important in what you learned during this process? Yeah, for, for me, I think that I don't know necessarily that I, I learned this as much as it was reinforced in me is that, you know, we're all humans kind of doing the best that we can getting through, through life and to approach one another with compassion and kindness is, you know, and love is critical. Um, yeah, I, I just feel like the film itself, I think for me through the process, the film itself reinforced that because I myself learned so much through the process about who I am and how I interact in the world and ways in which I can improve in, in those interactions. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, th I think that's a big one for me. Yeah, and I think for me, I think it's probably really similar to Justin's, but like approaching things with openness, whether that be like friendships, other people, but like for like with this film for me, just like kind of being open to where the process was going to take us. Like we didn't really have a, a script to start with. Like it was kind of just exploring together and being open to all the different different places we could take it and like what was felt right. So. I like started tearing up at Justin's response. And I, and I think also in what it triggered in me was that it's a really powerful thing when you've been taught that these parts of your story, that you've been taught that there are parts of your story that aren't safe, right? That make you likely to experience danger or likely to get hurt if you tell people about them or they're just shameful, right? Like you kind of hate yourself because of those parts of your story. And then you allow them to be witnessed by people that really love you. It's a really healing thing. And it kind of, I don't know that I completely like got over the fear of sharing a story with someone that felt shameful, but it planted an extra seed in my mind that said, you know, maybe you can share this story and still be loved, you know, and maybe you can, you can be open about the parts of you that feel really scary and be loved not just in spite of those but for them in addition to all the other parts of who you are and I really got to experience that during the filmmaking process not just in the process of giving you know sharing the film with the world but even just in the microcosm of our relationship um, and that was really healing and powerful for me Thank you all for sharing. I think the film really shows that bond that the three of you had for Laura to feel safe enough to open up in the way that they did. And that was beautiful. So this question is for all three of you again. Uh, you know, right now there's a lot of backlash when we talk about climbing or the outdoors. So many people are asking, why can't a film or an article or even someone's own social media just be about climbing? Why do we have to talk about things that are considered politics or identity? For the three of you, why was it important that this film was about more than just a climb? Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, like, I think one of the inspirations for like wanting to tell this story is like telling stories that do involve climbing, but have so much more depth to them. Um, and I mean, I think we have so many stories that are just about climbing already. And like, we need more stories that are about the people who are climbing and like that are more representative of these communities, so. Yeah, I wonder something that comes to mind with that question is 
you know, whether all those other stories that are like just about climbing, if they're just incomplete stories, you know, if we're leaving out an entire side of the story that really is there no matter who we're talking about, you know, athlete stories are profoundly human stories. There are stories about people going out and and pushing their limits and learning about themselves. And there's always context. I think that it's a really unique way to tell stories that might otherwise be really charged. Like, for instance, the story of a trans person comp- like playing and participating in sports. That story might be really charged, but when you just look at them playing their sport, you experience a really human side of that story. So. I think it's important to have the opportunity to tell the full picture of a story about the outdoors, about sports. Yeah. And I think Blake and Laura both touched on this, but you know, when you make a film that has more depth to it, then you're creating representation for an entire group of people to actually be able to see themselves in the outdoors. Um, while making this film, you know, it, it came up a number of times from people um, talking about like, oh, part of the reason that, that I love the climbing community is because it's always been open to, you know, to everyone from like the weirdos to the freaks to, you know, it's like this very open thing. Why, why do we need to like highlight it? And it's like that in and of itself to me felt really closed, not open. You know, whereas to me, the idea is like, yes, I mean, all of, all of these sports being outside should be open to everyone and they should be a safe place for people to go and and find the peace and solitude that we all enjoy when when we're out there doing these things but if if people don't feel genuinely safe and secure being out there if they don't feel like it's a place where they can see themselves or that they see anyone like themselves um, then it creates a very myopic community that you know uh, uh, isn't very inclusive. And so to me, to make a film like this with more depth, because it's not, I mean, this, this is a film about, about Lore's experience as a human being. And part of that experience is certainly their gender identity, but it is so much more complex than that. There are so many aspects of Lore's life and experience that resonated with me in ways that are deeply profound and have actually shifted the way in which I operate in the world just in these last three years. And, and, you know, for me to be able to create a film that has all of that in there means that there's somebody out there, they don't necessarily have to be gender non-binary, they just have to be a human to watch this film and get something from it and feel as though they grow as an individual through this experience. And, and, I don't get that just looking at a film that is just about climbing or just reading an article about how hard something was. You know, I, I get that from being able to connect with somebody's authentic and vulnerable self. And I have to say that that Laura and Blake's relationship opened this world up on camera in a way that that is really rare and beautiful to see. And, and uh, I I'm so honored to be a part of it and hopefully shift the way that people tell these types of stories in the future. Well, thanks you all for sharing. That was beautiful. I really liked what you had to say, Laura, about some of the representation right now in videos not fully being complete and representing an individual's experience. You know, this film goes into so many different aspects of your life. And so I've got a couple questions for you right now. One is, what does it feel like to be a non-binary role model when we haven't had that sort of representation out there yet? Yeah, that's something I've been thinking about a lot. You know, especially I work directly with queer youth. And so it is a somewhat new role for me in the climbing community, but not a completely new role. And I think it would be really easy to try to create representation by saying, you know, this is my story, so this is what it means to, if you're supporting me in the right ways, you're supporting other non-binary people in the right ways, and like try and create this rule book for people, or try and create like a rule book for other non-binary people, to, and that's not really authentic, right? Because there are so many different ways to express your gender identity. 
And there's so many different ways that people feel safe in the world or feel supported. So something I just keep coming back to is that the best thing that I can do is focus on taking care of myself, on showing up in the best ways that I know possible, and on staying as fresh as I can so that I can do the work that I want to do. You know, and that if I'm feeling well and I'm able to show up fully for people in all the different capacities that I want to, that that's the best way that I can role model. Because someone else might have completely different things that they need to do for self-care, but they can see, hey, there's one healthy example of what it means to be non-binary. There's one healthy example of what it means to be queer. And as a kid, that was what I was looking for. You know, not people that were, had the exact same experience as me, but just people out there doing normal things, like navigating a normal life. You know, and knowing that I could have my own version of that was really important to me. So I guess that's what I want to put out in the world is just an example of someone doing their best to take care of themselves and live a life that they feel is worthwhile every day. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. That's so important right now. I think we always hear the, the phrase, you need to put on your own mask, like if a plane is crashing before you can take care of someone else. And I think all too often we tend to try to focus on everything else and not take that time for self-care. And so that's a really important thing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think for some, this film might be the first time they've really had experience seeing more in depth about a trans person's life. Why do you feel it's important for stories like these to be told? I think so often the conversations that we have about the queer community and especially about trans people are dehumanized conversations. You know, where you look at people in state legislatures talking about the bodies of trans people or their rights to have access to health care, play sports, use the bathroom, you know, and, and there's not a face put to those conversations. We don't realize that these are just members of our community that are doing their best to get through their days and are facing serious obstacles to do that because of hatred. You know, and so if someone hasn't had the opportunity to spend an hour listening to the story of a trans person before, it might be hard for them to get out of their head intellectualizing the, in these debates and really think of these as human stories. And so my hope for the film is that if people get to spend an hour with someone who is a human, right? Who has a, I have a human story. It's full of things that I, you know, I like succeed on rock climbs. I have hard days. I have family and friends that love me and, and support me when I'm not, you know, showing up as my best and, and when I am. Like that story is really powerful because it just allows people to see that when we're having these conversations, and especially when we're starting to get away from considering that we're talking about real people, that we bring it back to, we're talking about humans, right? That want to live well in the world. So if I have any hope for the film, it's that people get that experience out of it. Yeah, that's such an important point about all the legislation right now. I know as of this year in the United States, there's been more than 250 anti-trans bills that have been introduced. And as you mentioned, that's for kids participating in sports, that's for our bodies uh, in so many different areas, whether we can use the bathroom. And that kind of leads into the next question. So you are a trans athlete and there's so much controversy about that right now. There's bills being introduced that would prevent high school and younger kids from participating in sports. Why do you feel that it's important that trans people be able to participate in sports? I think that in this film, something that I hope was communicated was how amazing it's been for me to have athletics as a resource in my own healing journey and how much it means to be able to go outside and practice my sport and learn through it, right? Sports can be such an amazing resource 
for healing and for self-exploration. And the outdoors can be such this, it's a really powerful and potentially really neutralizing space for someone who experiences violence and other hardships outside in maybe their communities at work, at school. What we did with the film was really portray my story outside of this conversation that we tend to gravitate towards with trans people participating in sports, where we're talking about fairness and competition and whether trans people's bodies should be allowed to be in certain categories. Those conversations really get away from the importance of what does sports mean to us, right? Why do we participate in them and what value do they add to our lives? And what do we take away from someone when we take away their opportunity to participate? It's also really important to say, though, that the conversations that are being had about trans athletes are rarely actually about fairness in sports. It's a very polarizing and easy target for legislation that is made to set legal precedents for what it means to be a certain gender so that we can pass other laws that discriminate against trans people. I think me sharing my story as someone who's non-binary and masculine of center is a more acceptable story to a lot of people than focusing on trans women participating in sports. And I hope that if someone is looking at my story and thinking that it makes sense for me to participate and that it's fair, that they also take that seed that maybe is planted there and wonder if maybe the preconceptions that they're having about trans women participating in sports might also be wrong. So that was one of the reasons I wanted to put my story out there is that I hope that people can see that maybe some of the privileges that I have in my life are making my story feel more palatable to them. And they can use that to get a little bit curious about why that is and maybe be willing to be more open to different points of view that they haven't considered before about trans athletes and what it can mean for you know a kid to be able to play on a sports team where their gender is affirmed. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Being outside and, and recreating and participating in something can bring so much to us. One of the things I'd like to ask you about, so the one of the taglines of the film is one person's story. And there's so much variation, there's so much difference in all of us and how we present, what our day-to-day -day life is like. For folks out there who are wanting to support the trans community, wanting to support a trans family member, and knowing that we're all different, the needs of each of us are gonna vary. What are some common things or simple things that you think are maybe a little more general in how someone can go about supporting the trans community or a trans friend, family member, someone they care about? Yeah. I have two thoughts on that. Um, the first is the importance with leading with love instead of fear. I think so often, and this is maybe directed mostly towards parents, but could include friends and family members too, we hear about violence that trans people might experience when they're out. And when someone's kid comes to them and says, you know, I think that I'm questioning my sexual orientation or my gender identity, immediately a parent's mind might go to those stories of violence and they might get scared for their kid and they might think that the best way to protect that person that they love is to try and convince them to not share their gender identity or try and teach them to be afraid. And what we end up doing is just creating an entire world and a home that doesn't feel super safe for that kid, especially around some, a part of their, their identity that they can't change. So if you lead with love and you tell them, you know, I'm 100% on your side, I am here for you, I respect you, even if they go out in the world and they do experience violence or they do experience discrimination, then they can at least come home and feel safe. You know, if, and if you can be that one safe person for someone in your life, 
whether it's a friend or family member, that's such a powerful thing and it can be life-saving for someone. Another side of that is the power of having open conversations so that you're setting a precedent that we can talk about these things, right? At home, that can be starting the conversation yourself with your kid, you know, asking them if they ever have any questions about their gender or sexual orientation, inviting them to, to tell you about that. Even if maybe they don't end up having those questions, they learn that it's okay to talk about and they become a better support network for their friends and family down the road. So I think those two are things that come to mind for me. Did you have anything to add, Justin? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that those are both vitally important. I, for me, I would also add to, like, do the work. You know, don't rely on, on your child or your friend to, to give you all the answers. You know, find your own way to meet them where they are by, by learning reading and, and talking to others or, or just finding out more um, and question your own biases and, and where they're coming from and why they're there. Um, a lot of times, Laura said love versus fear, and I feel like a lot of times people come from that place of fear that either they're going to say the wrong thing or be offensive or um, so they so they kind of hold back a little bit and, and give yourself a little bit of, of leeway to like screw up a little bit you know I mean it's we're all human we're gonna screw up and and that's okay but but if you're coming from that place of love then you can you can meet somebody where they are and provide that safe space for them and um, and it does require your own work and it requires you to exist in an uncomfortable space from time to time and that's okay the entire idea of really doing that self-education and constantly striving to learn and be better is so important. No matter what our identity is, we can always learn more. We can always say or do the wrong thing. And I think that's just really great advice to constantly work on our allyship and learning how to be better. For Lore, I know as a trans person myself, I rarely see myself out there. And I'm sure there's so many people watching this film that might see themselves reflected back for the first time ever. What would you say to those folks? Yeah, I can really relate to that, Nikki. And I think the first thing that I would say is like, thank you, first of all, for being here. It means so much to me to be in community with all of you and I think that there can be an urgency when you see the story of someone in the queer community represented to wonder about your own identity as a queer person like am I being out enough am I doing enough you know, am I confident enough? Am I queer enough? Like all of these stories, these uh, questions come up. And the first thing I would say is to all of that, like, yes, if you're here tonight watching, like all of those enoughs are covered. And just reminding people to be so patient with themselves and so kind, because I really don't think that we're given the space to slow down that urgency about knowing about our identity. You know, like we're taught that either we have to hide it or we have to be like so out and open and, and excited and share it all. And, and what has meant the most to me over the years is the people that I can sit down with and say, I don't have everything figured out, but I'd love to bounce things around. And that has made me feel so safe and I would love for there just to be more space for curiosity and playfulness and patience in identity. And if you're in the queer community or not, and you saw yourself in some of the things, some of the struggles that I talked about and the things that I've found really challenging in my life, um, I hope that you know that you're not alone and that there are a ton of resources out there and that you are such an important human. 
you know, like that these things feel insurmountable to deal with and you don't have to conquer any of them today, but that there are support networks out there for you to get help, to find affinity spaces, and just to know that those things that we're struggling with make sense and it's okay that they're there. Um, so if you've seen yourself in any of those parts of the story, I hope that you know that you're in a really vibrant, resilient community and you have so many people in your corner ready to hold you up if you need them. That's beautiful, Laura. Thanks. I definitely feel like I saw myself in this and I really believe that so many others do as well. So thank you for that. So this last question is for all three of you. You know, in our society, we're kind of conditioned to always say, everything's fine. I'm okay when someone asks what's going on. And especially right now with everything going on in the last year with COVID and being isolated, I think a lot of people are struggling. What advice do all three of you have for moving beyond saying that I'm fine? You know, there's so many different issues this film brings up, and I'm sure whether it's a trans identity, whether it's disordered eating, or any of the other topics the film talks about, someone's going to see themselves and hopefully realize I need help. What advice do you have for those folks? Yeah, I think it's um, really important to reach out to like your friends and your family with those things. Um, and like, I know that can be really hard. Like it's something I've personally really struggled with, but those people are like going to show up for you and like, it can be really powerful to like have that support. So I think like, I know it can be really hard, but it's like really important to reach out to those people in your life. Yeah. I'll second that with Blake. Um, it has, it's been a hard year for everyone and, and hard couple of years for everyone in different ways. And, um, one of the hardest things for me to, to, to understand was that when I was hurting and just holding it in and just kind of sitting in this space and, and, and spiraling out, I wasn't making any progress and I wasn't getting closer to my friends. But when I got to a point to where I just had to reach out for help, um, you know, I found out personally that I was actually giving a gift to my friends by asking them for help because they were able to show up for me in a way that they didn't know they needed to. Um, but also I think it let them know that they could also ask for help, you know, that, you know, it, it kind of helps to break down that, that um, stigma of I'm fine, Nikki. I, th I think it helps to open up that idea that um, if we all can just ask for help, then we can also all just start to show up for one another and, and provide a safe place. And um, I think it's, yeah, it's vital because we're not all fine. We're all actually pretty screwed up from time to time and um, we don't have to wallow in that alone. I think I had a really powerful moment that all of you got to share in in the film, but the moment of sitting on the couch with my mom during our interview together about my suicide attempt and getting to sit with my mom more than 10 years later, you know, and just like giggle on a couch with her and like get to be with her and, and have that moment where I really reflected on the really real possibility that I could have missed that and I could have missed like so many of the beautiful moments that I've gotten to have as an adult and it took a lot of courage to speak to her and and then it took courage every day after that to like know where it could go if I didn't speak openly to people about what was going on and if I didn't get support. 
and having that moment to realize how worth it it was to go through that really hard step every day of being so honest and how many connections I've made with people in my life that have felt so authentic. It was really humbling, actually, to like have that moment there on the couch with my mom to let it sink in. Um, I hope that I can share that with y'all, you know, to, and that through this film is just that it's always scary to say that things are going wrong, you know, because we don't want to seem broken. We don't want to like see everything crash down when we admit it. We think like people will like us better if we're just like happy and go lucky all the time. But finding that there is a there's a really amazing overlap between living a fulfilling life and being honest about our pain and that you don't have to choose one or the other. And in fact, you can't, right? That they're like inextricably connected. And I think just opening up that space yourself for someone to share that it makes it so that other people realize how much of a gift you gave them and they learn to do the same. Well, thank you all for sharing so much, being so honest and open with us. This film was beautiful. It's been a great experience working with you all on this. So thank you for sharing. Thanks for just being so open. Uh, for those who are watching, please remember that the resources are going to be at the end of this film. If there's anything that came up in this film that you want some help with, um, it's okay to not be okay. We all need help. Um, so please ask for it. It's really important. And thank you for viewing. Thanks for being a part of our community. And thanks for being here. Yeah, I would really like to thank everyone for showing up and watching the film. Um, we really appreciate you doing that with openness and compassion and really hope that you enjoyed the film. Yeah, whether you came tonight with a ton of experience with the queer community or this is your first time um, getting to know someone on a screen who is a member of the queer community, I hope that you're taking away some new learning lesson, maybe a little bit of curiosity about your own identity or the way that you're creating safe space in your own community. Yeah, and I'd really like to thank Lore for showing up in this film with such openness and vulnerability. Um, you opened up a world um, and gave us a truly human story that, that I think everybody in the audience can identify with. And um, if you're struggling at all with any of the topics that we discussed in the film, uh, there will be a list of, of numbers after the, the panel here that you can use as a resource for yourself. If you know somebody else that's struggling, you can use those as a resource for them as well. And we just really want you to know that we love you and we are sincerely glad that you're here.
Blake, introduce yourself. I'm Blake. Mm-hmm. What are you doing? I'm filming you. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm filming you. <laughs> Thank you.